So I'm pressing live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanaugh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanaugh. Here at Cavanaugh's HR, we have some exciting news. We're launching a, a crowdfunding campaign for Cavanaugh's HR starting March 2nd. Go to https cavanaughshr.co slash crowdfunding for more information. Please donate and share with your networks. Our guest today is Brandy Bernowski. Brandy, are you ready to be great today? Yeah, ready. Brandy is a digital strategist, website developer, and founder of Alchemy Plus AIM, a company that helps entrepreneurs and business owners elevate their online presence and enhance their digital experience. Her academic background in theater, philosophy, and physics was the perfect foundation for launching her business, where she's worked with Brene Brown, Laverne Cox, Allie Brown, Judy Smith, and other notable thought leaders since 2013. She was an advocate for using technology in ways that humanize, connect, and serve people as well for asking deeper philosophical questions and teaching others to think more broadly about impact when they create. Brandy, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited to chat with you. So Brandy, you're in the New York City area right now, right? Now, right? New Jersey, New York City? Yes, I am. So what's the life right now? Is that is like, how's COVID affecting you? How's the weather going for you? How's that whole nine yards going for you right now? Uh, there's definitely a lot of snow we've been, I feel like it's, it's actually still coming down at the moment and we've been shoveling a bunch lately. Um, you know, what's interesting is that because I had already set up my business, like to be virtual and online COVID didn't actually affect my day to day to already. Like it was, you know, my entire team is remote. So, um, that wasn't kind of a huge impact. I will say it has been a huge impact, like not being able to see friends or travel as much. And, um, you start to feel that after a while, just like, you know, I, I, I grew up in New Jersey. There's a lot to love about New Jersey in this whole area, but at the same time, I'm ready for somewhere tropical and warm, <laughs> uh, so, especially in the middle of so much snow. So Brandon, before we start your business, I'm going to your background some, so you have an interesting background, very interesting. Like you have experience with theater, philosophy, physics, archery. Like I, I can't say that word, but Renaissance woman comes to mind, right? Like you do a lot. But so talk a little about your uh, theater background. Yeah, I uh, I started acting, I think when I was in, I must've been in like fourth grade. And my mother put me in it specifically because I was such a shy kid that she thought maybe <laughs> if, I was, if I was on stage, that would help. Um but it kind of, it, it stuck with me and really became a love of mine. And I ended up when I was applying to colleges, I applied to four schools for academics and four schools for theater and got into New York university, which has not only a phenomenal theater program, but also like so many good academic pieces to it. Um, and I decided that's, you know, I really wanted to pursue a career in acting and, and in theater and um, while that is not where I am now, I was really grateful for the education that I had there because I think it exposed me in a whole like kind of grander way to the industry for me to understand that um, I loved I loved learning about acting. I love learning about like our inner motivations as human beings. And it's kind of funny because like, like now that I think back to some of my theater training, it was kind of like a primer in marketing because, really when you're acting on stage, it's all about, um, you know, when you speak to someone, it's you're speaking to them to get them to do something. And that's kind of what marketing is too. It's kind of what websites are somehow. And um, so there's some things I still kind of pull from there of like understanding human nature and what motivates people. So uh, yeah, it just, I spent four years learning and really got a lot out of it. Um, really appreciative of the time, but at the end, you know, I was, I was in New York starting in, uh, 1998. And so I was there in September, 2001 when everything happened. And I think that kind of really shifted my perspective of, do I really want to go into theater or is there something more that I have to give to the world? And, you know, it re really came down to that answer and just kind of kept following my curiosity. And that's inevitably what led me to physics, philosophy, uh, religion and, you know, doing work in like science studies. How old were you first to start doing theater? Like how old were you, what are, when your mom said you're going to do this? It, so it must, I must've been like 10 or 11. 
Um, and she just put me in like a really, like when I look back to the theater training I had back then, I mean, it was, you know, it's for kids. So they gave you a couple of lines in a show and you got to sing and whatnot. It was fun. Um, and I studied more in, intensely when I was in, um, middle school and high school, like, you know, I started to learn the different types of acting training, like Stella Adler's training versus method acting and things like that. And just kind of kept, kept on it. Um, did a lot of singing as well, had a couple of leads in musicals and in operas also. Um, but when I had decided I wanted to pursue it, I, I decided not to pursue it in the musical theater capacity and instead to focus on um, what people in theater called straight plays, meaning plays that don't have, uh, you don't break out into song and dance suddenly. So from your theater career, what's the, what's like one moment where you were like, okay, this is it. I'm, I'm, this might be for me. Like what's your best role you had so far as they are like, like, like you were like, okay, uh, I, I killed this one right here. Um, you know, it, it's kind of funny cause it was a small role, but I, I loved the roles that were unusual. And, you know, I got to play some leads in shows. Like I got to do Juliet in Romeo and Juliet when I was 15 and I really loved that. Um, but there was this one high school play that we did and it was like a murder mystery. And I got to play like the super mousy secretary. And it was just such a character piece that it was so much fun. And even in college, we did, um, we did a Shakespeare play and we actually like, didn't use traditional gender casting. So I actually got to play like the villain of the show. And that was a blast. It just gave me this whole kind of new ability to like not step into like the nice good girl role, which is how I was traditionally cast on things and to be able to like play like an evil villain <laughs> in one of the plays. So. So Brandon, have you done any like, like recently, any, like any theater, like na local neighborhood community theaters or you or this pretty much a part of your past? You haven't done it for a while. <laughs> It, it, it's pretty much sadly a part of my past. It's kind of funny because I, once I moved back to New Jersey, which was about three years ago, I did start looking at local theater um, and what was available. <laughs> and it was, uh, there was a play that I, I was considering auditioning for, which got shut down because of COVID. So um, it was a little unfortunate and it's, you know, it is certainly hard to balance um, the demands of a theater schedule. Like I know what that looks like. I've, I've, done it in the past with the demands of running a business and starting up another business in the process. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's in my near future, but I do hope to get back into it someday. I just have so much fun and really love meeting new people. Um, and yeah, I do. I still love being on stage in that capacity. Like it's, it's fun when you get to sing on stage. So next let's talk about physics now. Yes. I'm sure you have to be smart to be in theater, but physics, that's a whole different level of smart, right? Like, how did that come about? Do you, you just have a good background on math and just went to it or? I was, I, I was always a strong student. Like I was pretty much, you know, like an A, A, B student, um, you know, graduated with like a 4.1 GPA from high school and stuff like that was in honors classes and um, was a strong math student. I really didn't think anything too much about math when I was really younger at all. Like it's just something that I did in class and, you know, sometimes particularly in high school struggled through. Um, but I had a phenomenal, like truly phenomenal physics teacher, my junior year of high school, who just, he just had so much excitement about the world and just shared that with us in class that it just became something fun. And it became like another way of like looking at the world, um, and imagining the way the world could be. So, I, you know, I, I, I did it in my junior year of high school, then did AP physics my senior year. And my plan was to actually go to NYU and pursue a double major in theater and physics. But um, the demands of the theater training schedule, I mean, it's, it was pretty intense and trying to fit in early morning theater, like early morning physics classes after you've, you know, in act like in rehearsals until midnight was just really, really kind of exhausting. So, so I ended so, up doing so a minor basically, physics. You, you're basically like a, like a student athlete, right? Pretty yeah. Much. Yeah. It, it, there's, there's a lot. I mean, like the days, usually we were in um, theater training, like intensely three full days a week, like 6am to, you know, 12pm sort of thing. 
Um, so, you know, you had two days to get in your other academic classes and the work that was required for them. So it was really a lot. So I kind of just allowed it to be a bit of a minor then. Um, and eventually when I went back for a second degree, returned to it just because I, I was just so fascinated by, by the world and kind of took an astrophysics class on a whim, um, just because astrophysics had always interested me. And I still remember, um, when the professor put up this X-ray image of our universe with the supermassive black hole at the center and in, in X-ray kind of, uh, like rate like radiation light like this black hole just lights up and it was just so amazing so um I really kind of just stuck with it and like again uh, had to be worked through physics is it's difficult um and wonderful and worth it and I was actually I have to say I was as much as I liked the math in physics I love the the philosophical part of it, of like, what does this say about our world? Like, how fascinating is it that we can see all of this in, in the universe and beyond? And we are this like tiny little specks on the planet. So um, I really like, I really kind of engaged with it from more of that philosophical perspective and just um, was fascinated. I did an internship in gravitational lensing of dark matter just because dark matter is so wild and unknown and really neat. Um, so I had a lot of fun in the department while I was there and, you know, got to learn some things, took a quantum mechanics class as well, because quantum mechanics like is even freakier. So. So a little off subject, there's a person I follow on TikTok. I can't remember her name, but she's an astrophysicist photographer, like you said. And the pictures you posted, it's like, that's, that's very taken. They're just amazing. And the, the detail on there, like millions and millions of miles away. It's like, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty awesome what she does. Yeah, it's, it just be so cool. I mean, and yesterday they like landed these rovers on Mars and are going to get so much more cool info from them. It's just, it's ongoing. Um, the, the kind of push, you know, the, the breakthroughs that, that they get to have and ways they get to explore this universe beyond our planet. So what, what are your degrees in from NYU? So from NYU, I have a degree in theater. So it's a BFA in theater, minors in physics and math. And then I got a second bachelor's from Rutgers University in physics, philosophy, and religion with a minors in math. And then I do not have a third degree. I only did, I managed to do two years um, studying for a PhD before I decided that wasn't the path for me. So theater and physics wasn't hard enough for you. You had to go get a philosophy degree. Like, are you a gun for punishment or something? Yeah, I, I just honestly, for me, it's always just been about following the curiosity that I had. Um, and really, it's like I hit the point sometimes where I realized I was only a few courses away from like having the math, like the major with it. So why not? Um, why not learn a little bit more and maybe push myself into areas that I didn't love as much? Like I really with philosophy, I love philosophy of science and, uh, you know, philosophy of physics and philosophy of biology do not so much love political philosophy. Like that was kind of a hard class for me. Um, but it is good to kind of, uh, be in uncomfortable situations sometimes and learn things you may not, you know, always that may not be at the top of your list to learn because sometimes they actually help you grow as an individual in unexpected ways. Yeah, all the classes I took in college, the, my philosophy class, the one I had the most fun. It's the most fun, most engaging, where I learned the most. Is this? Yeah, it was a. If, if college, all the college would be like my philosophy class. I don't think I would have left. It was just a great class. Yeah, and it's it's wonderful when you are encouraged, uh, you know, to really think and like think for yourself and like have your own opinion and support it. In so many other courses, they want you to kind of like accept the knowledge that's being handed to you. But in philosophy, they want you to push back. They want you to come up with new ideas. And, you know, they're not always going to be perfect. Like some may be flawed, but it's about taking that chance. I remember a philosophy class, the instructor came in and like he, the first 20 wars, like 18 were cuss words, right? Like blah, blah, blah. He said, as long as you, you say in this class is not worse than that, you can say whatever you want to. You know, pretty much said you can say whatever you want to, right? Yep. So next, archery. How do you get involved with archery? So I, I tried it when I was a kid. 
and really, really liked it. It was like one of those things that we did on a family vacation in the Poconos. And it kind of stuck with me. And when I was in San Diego, they had a very, well, San Diego is a kind of a hub for some of the best like Olympic style archery out there. And unfortunately, because of my, um, my PhD work, I did not get to do it out there, but it really like, it kind of popped up in my life again there. And it wasn't until after I left the PhD program and I was uh, working for a nonprofit in Washington, DC, that I realized like I had the time to do something. And I started just a friend and I would do some, like, you know, we would do those like group bonds together. We'd find like, you know, like p- pottery painting and archery was one of those weird little group bonds that came up. So we went out to a range in Virginia and tried it. And we were both kind of smitten. She had a teacher that she worked with at the school she was teaching who happened to have two spare, like two spare fiberglass bows. Like, I mean, really, really rudimentary. And um, he allowed us to borrow them. And we would go out to this range in Maryland, which is a beautiful, like outdoor range. And we would shoot like Saturday mornings together. And I hit the point where I realized that I wasn't becoming any better and I really wanted to be better. So she and I had a, we'd gone, we bought bows and very fortunately the, um, the, one of the people who helped us up at Lancaster archery supply, um, had contacts in Northern Virginia that he was able to connect me with. And I mean, really wonderful group of traditional archers who I I was really kind of focused more on traditional archery, which is like without all of the additional accoutrements that uh, Olympic recurve bows have. So it's still a recurve just without all this, the sights and things like that. So um, hooked me up with some wonderful men and women who became my teachers and friends and really showed me um, just kind of, I mean, they would take me to events with them, um, taught me how to really shoot. And it really became something I fell in love with and really enjoyed doing. It was, it was an absolute blast. So archery, I mean, I don't think most people realize this, but you can't be a weakling and pull the bow without string back, right? You got to have some kind of strength, right? No. I mean, like, it's not for the weak hearted, right? It's, it's a whole, a lot more difficult than it seems, right? If you see somebody like, like it is. On archery, like just pull it back easily, but it's, it's not easy. It is not. And it is something like, even when you think you're strong, you are using an indifferent set of muscles with archery and the hold particularly. So very often I find this to be true of like guys who just start archery is like, they want like the heaviest poundage bow they can get. They're like a hundred pound. You can't, I mean, it's just so hard. Don't do that to your muscles. I started out low, um, and kind of like worked my way up to heavier and heavier draw weights. Um, because you want to like build the muscles in the right way and you don't want to injure yourself. Like that is really key. And I, I did have it at one point where, um, we jumped weights too fast for me. And I did, I injured my shoulder and my shoulder began to kind of like torque inwards. And that became a whole other thing that I had to, you know, fix and deal with while still learning to practice. So, um, and it is, it's, I have to say, it's also different per the type of bow that you have. So, you know, recurves, if you're pulling 30 pounds, you're holding 30 pounds compounds, which a lot of people use for hunting, you do the initial pull and then it kind of drops off because of the way that the the gears and, um, work on the bow. So it doesn't feel like, like if you have a 30 pound pull, it drops off and only feels like you're holding maybe three pounds instead. So different, you know, different uses for different things, but, um, I, you know, I mean, I, I enjoyed it so much. I actually even became a certified instructor level one and level two and had some fun teaching it at a, at a day camp. Well, a kind of a sleepaway camp for adults at one point as well. So do you ever do any bow hunting or do you just do like, like regular archery? Just, just a uh, foam and target for me. Um, I have a lot of friends who, who hunt. It's personally not something I I don't think I would be able to fully do it. I, I don't fault them for doing it though. I'm not one of those crazy people who was like, no, you can't hurt an animal. I mean, there's, there's, there's kind of a, a long conversation yeah. about it. Um, and I learned a lot from them during the process, but, uh, yeah, for, for me personally, no, we kind of, we feed the deer in my family. My mom <laughs> even used to name the deer in our yard. So, uh, it's just kind of, I, I, I couldn't. <laughs> no, understood. So next question, hope this comes out the right way, but you know, you, if you have physics background, philosophy background, all these great things to be doing, 
like why not do something with physics versus like being an entrepreneur? Like, I mean, you could be working for Elon Musk, you know, sending rockets to Mars, all these great, great things you'd be doing, you know, why be an entrepreneur versus one of these other background things? Yeah, so I didn't necessarily get into business to be an entrepreneur. Um, I didn't know that's what was gonna happen to me. I really, I started a business at, at the time, um, the nonprofit I was working with in DC, I was actually, it was connected with NASA. We were doing some earth science education work for them. So I was kind of even utilizing some of my science background in that, that job that I had. But what it came down to is that I discovered I did not do well in a cubicle. Like there was something about going to work, especially in the winter when it's dark and then you leave work and it's dark again. And like, you don't really see the sunlight that really got to me. And I was just naturally, I wanted to travel more. I just, I wanted something, I wanted to try something different really is, is how it happened. Um, and my only plan was to be a freelance developer. Like I was going to be a solopreneur. I, I didn't even know the word solopreneur at the time. I was just going to be a freelancer um, and take on some jobs and that would be it. You know, I could work from wherever I could travel to wherever I wanted to and work from there. And I just decided to see how that would go. It was about two years into actually um, being a freelancer that I started to, to kind of bring on some team members, like an assistant and another developer. And it kind of just went all downhill from there. Um, yeah. And suddenly I found myself as instead of a freelance developer, actually as an entrepreneur. So I still have a really fond love for physics, but I, in some ways, all of the, um, I, I feel like when you're an entrepreneur, you don't have to operate by anyone else's rules. You get to kind of make up some of your own rules as you go along. And I really love that. Like, I really love being able to create in my business and just keep following the curiosity that I have of like, oh, let's try that. Like, I want to, I want to learn this and offer this and see how it goes and grow in this way and create this company culture in a way that um, feels great to everyone who's involved in it. So Brandy, you know, if you're a software developer, you know, you pretty much got to keep up to date with all the changing code and new updates. In physics, once you know physics, you pretty much know physics the rest of your life, all those like changes in physics you got to keep up to date with. Well, physics itself, it, there are many parts of it that do stay the same, but there is always growing technology that can be used to learn more about the universe and about the world around us. So um, in some ways, like you've got to be, into technology when you're in physics as much as you are, you know, in other roles and things like that. Um, but yeah, the nice thing also about being an entrepreneur is that my team keeps up to date with the cool stuff now, and I get to keep up to date with other things, you know, in, in the business world. So Brandy, uh, you like to travel a lot, right? I do. I love any opportunity I have. The last year has been really hard to travel, but I, I do love exploring new places. What's been your favorite place so far that you've been to? Personally, I adore the Isle of Skye in Scotland. Um, it's one of those places that absolutely just spoke to me the moment I arrived. Uh, and I've been back there. Well, I've been there three times. So um, it was it was kind of wonderful because the second time I went back, uh, the first time I was there, I happened to stay at this great little inn in Carbos, which is uh, home to the only whiskey distillery in on the Isle of Skye. And um, at the end, they've got a pub attached to it. So I got to like meet the people who worked there and meet some of the locals, all of the locals hang out at the pub. And uh, it just, it struck me. And so I decided, you know, a couple of years later to go back and walked into the, the pub and um, went up to the bar to order um, some lunch. And I recognized the the bartender like he had been there last time I was there and what was absolutely wild is that uh, when he as I was talking to him he goes I know you don't even said he's like you and I'm like how how do you remember that um so yeah somehow he totally recognized me even though I hadn't been there in two years and it kind of just made me feel like you know, 
here's like my home away from home that I never expected to have, but it really is just a, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to be. Um, just like, I, 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 I dream always of going back. It just kind of calls to me. So Randy, where's the place you've been to that's probably like maybe off the being, off the being path or maybe off the wall. I don't know if I've had too many like extreme off the wall places. I think it's the way that I travel that is more unusual. So I've done a couple of um, like trips overseas by myself with only having maybe the first two or three nights planned out of like a two week stay and not entirely knowing what's going to happen after that. Now, my boyfriend, I've discovered travels entirely differently. He has to have every moment, like he needs to know where he's sleeping every single night. I am the type who can like, you know, it go somewhere and then decide to make a change or decide to just see what's available last minute. Um, so I've, I kind of operate that way. I even did a road trip across. I did a road trip from San Diego up to Vancouver and then down across the United States, pretty much in the same way. Like I had a couple places to stay along the way, but there were days that I'd be like, Oh, maybe I'm going to stay in Seattle an extra night. I don't know. Um, it's, it's a little counterintuitive to how most people like to travel, but I have found that sometimes it's nice to push yourself to not always know what's coming next and just be a little open to whatever the universe sends your way. Randy, next, can you talk about how you help people elevate their online presence? Yeah, absolutely. So this is like really the fun part of the work that I get to do um, is really kind of helping people step more into themselves in, but like online. So it's, It's interesting because a lot of people, when they're starting their business, they are so often potentially modeling other people's businesses, people who they've seen be successful. So sometimes I I have people come to me and they say, oh, I love so-and-so's website. I want a website just like hers. And the reality is you can't have her website because it's her website. And like, you need something different because it's your, like you are you. And really kind of stepping into yourself online and understanding that may look a little different than it does from the day to day. Like you can be more fully sometimes yourself online because you have a different space to be in. And um, so, so, so like very often I notice a lot of um, introverts are not as introverted online because they're in new spaces where they feel safe to kind of be more outspoken than they would normally be in a party or something like that. I know I'm certainly one of those. You put me in a party and I feel like I'm a wallflower, like really quickly you get me online and in conversations with people. And I'm just, it just feels easier. It feels less scary for some reason. So, you know, I spend a lot of time with uh, the entrepreneurs we work with really hope like helping them figure out how they want to showcase themselves um, in a way that's still very true to who they are and how they want to, like, how are they helping people? Like, what's that conversation? How do they want them to feel? How do they want to feel about themselves online as well? And really starting to think about anything, any experience that people have of them, how do we start to bring that forth into their website or, you know, their Instagram or anything else? Because I really think that there's an opportunity with all of the social media and websites and things that we do online for us to really kind of extend the experience that we provide in person online and just make something very consistent and um, just elegant in, in the way that we can interact with each other. So Brandy, for the people out there who might be intimidated by being online, how do you have to help them to overcome this? I think it's about starting small. So I have definitely worked with people who, um, are very reluctant to even have a picture on their own website. Like they will have their own website, like, like, let's say like brandybernowski.com and they will be like, I don't want my photo anywhere. So we start small. We don't start with a giant header photo for them. We start with like a photo on the home, like on the homepage somewhere and we can work up from there. And I just remind them that, you know, it's, it's really important. And I think it's even more important now. Like we want to feel like we're buying from and interacting with other human beings. So having a photo there, it can make a really big difference in people's perception of who you are and what you have to offer. So Brandy, when you're doing the website development and the online presence, is it like a give and take between the customer? Like, or like, do you tell the customer you should do this and do that? Or the customer says, no, I don't want this. How does that process work? 
I think it's a constant conversation. I never want to push anyone into something that they aren't, um, that they don't feel good about. I'm not going to say that they don't feel comfortable with, because sometimes you do have to push people a little bit outside of their comfort zone to achieve the results that they want to achieve. But I'm never going to push anyone in a direction that actually feels really disingenuine to them. Um, I know, you know, especially when it comes to like social media and marketing these days, there's so much advice people have like, oh, you need to be on this social media platform or that one. And I will tell the entrepreneurs I have, I work with over and over again, like, I think you need to be willing to experiment with different platforms. But if something really doesn't work well for you, if you find it to be energetically draining rather than energizing, it might be time to leave it behind. Like Twitter is not for everyone. Neither is Instagram, you know? So find those places where your ideal people hang out and you feel like you're excited to be, or at least, you know, maybe that you don't hate being and engage in those spots. Don't feel like you have to do everything, but sometimes it's just about like getting them out of their comfort zone a little bit and just, it's just experiment. Like I'm not like, you're, you don't have to sign a contract that says you'll, you know, do Instagram forever in blood or something like that. Like you can really just, you know, try it for two months, see, see what it's like, see what kind of results you get, see if you enjoy it, you know, play with it a little bit. And I think that's sometimes what we forget is that, you know, there's so much opportunity just to be playful in our business and not like realize we don't have to commit day one that we can just try it and see if it works and just be willing to really check in with ourselves and say like, is it not working or are we like, are we holding ourselves back for some reason? Are we afraid? And that's why it's not working. Brandon, that's a good advice to experiment, right? Cause like you might go on Instagram the first time and you know, you might, you, know, you might kill it on there. Now, of course, you know, if you go on Instagram and a, and a month later, you have like no engagement, no followers, then you might want to, you know, do something else too. But I definitely believe you experiment with everything. So Brandy. You, yeah, you, it, it really, I think that's kind of like one of the things I took from science. Yeah, you definitely got to experiment because you never know what's going to stick or not stick until you try it. Yeah. So Brandy, you've worked with some well-known people in the past, Brene Brown, some other people. How do you put yourself, and of course, I'm pretty sure you didn't wake up one day, Monday morning, I'm going to work with Renee, with Renee Brown today, right? What steps, what was the process to put yourself in a situation to have this opportunity? So for me, actually, um, some of my biggest clients have come from past relationships that I've had. So I actually got into web development because I was a blogger. I had, you know, a self-hosted WordPress site. It was like a lifestyle blog. I also had a food blog, which was really great during grad school because you get free food from a food blog. But um, I was just blogging and I happened to uh, be at a, a conference for bloggers called Alt Summit in like the early days. It's like year two of Alt Summit. Um, and happened just like at a random event, met another blogger. She and I stayed in touch and she eventually did some graphic design work for Brene and introduced us. And I will say, I think over and over again, like most of my business has come from just having relationships and being genuine in those relationships with people. Like I'm never in a, I'm never in relationship with someone to get something for them. I really just genuinely love these people that I get to interact with. And it comes up that they refer you, you know, when the time comes. So, um, really like every big client I have, uh, has come from just really strong relationships with people and, um, supporting them and celebrating with them and, um, you know, being willing to, to say, yeah, I'll have that phone call. If, if you, if you can introduce me when, when they're ready to introduce you to someone. Brandy, for those who don't know, can you define web development? I mean, it's like, it's like just build a WordPress site, HTML sites. What exactly is web development? Yeah. So web development can be many, many things. Uh, for us particularly, we focus on custom WordPress development. So th this is really for self-hosted WordPress sites. We do, um, like we're not taking a pre-made theme and just styling it. Like we are actually building the code from scratch. Uh, and, and that's something that I don't recommend for everyone. Um, I sometimes have clients come to me and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is not the right thing for you right now. Um, but for a lot of the clients we work with, uh, they have some very, very custom business needs and we end up do, we, we create a lot of interesting 
and unique functionality that helps their business really operate uh, at a, in a way that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. They would have to rely on like so many different systems to get things together. So um, yeah, that's so our for us, it's like the way I always kind of describe it to people, what we do, we're like the builders of a home. Like sometimes you have an architect who would be like the designer for a site. Um, and really what my team and I do really focus in on is like the actual construction of the website to make sure that it is beautiful and elegant and serves the client's business needs like over and over again it it's great if it's pretty but if it doesn't help them get to achieve their goals and like to the point of success they want to be in and like make their lives easier then it's not as good as it can be so do y'all charge by the project the hour or, or something else or a combination of all of them we usually charge for most of like projects we work on, we do like a flat project rate. Um, but then like for ongoing work with clients, like, you know, they're after, after we finish like the main website build, they'll come to us with the little things that will sometimes do like hourly if it's just so easy and fast, or uh, sometimes we get mini projects thereafter that we kind of create mini little project scopes for. How do you deal with people who have like a thousand uh, and one changes? Is it just a matter of like increasing the price to deal with it or how do you deal with them? So first thing I do is I write in two rounds of revisions to the site so that we don't end up in like four bazillion email exchange and forth. Um, so boundaries is really what it comes down to is like having clear boundaries with the client um, and, and helping them understand why those boundaries are in place. I always tell clients, your website is going to evolve because you and your business are evolving, but we are going to do our best to give you the ability to make those changes as you're evolving and to come back to us for the big stuff. I always tell my clients, like, I want you to come back to me when you're ready to launch a podcast and we need to start like thinking through what everything that needs to be in place for that. I don't want you to come back to me because you want to change some text on your homepage. That's it's, it's not a great use of my time and it's not a great use of your money. I can teach you how to do that. I can, like, we do a lot of walkthrough videos for our clients and then we put them on the dashboard so that they can in turn delegate it to someone either on their team or a VA or something like that. So, you know, that they are stepping, they're, they're being in their genius work and they're delegating um, a lot of the tasks that they should be delegating. So you know these websites, is it, are these websites hosted on your, on your domain, the customer domain or somewhere else? Typically it's, it's on their, like it's their domain and it's their hosting package. I'm a big believer in making sure my clients own their website and website presence. I don't want to own it for, I, I won't even buy a domain for a client because they should own it. I don't want them to ever feel like they are at my mercy, you know, especially like in this world, like you need to own your stuff. So um, I always make sure that they feel very, you know, walk through, like they feel guided in the process of making these decisions of like what hosts they're going to choose and what domain they want. A lot of people come to us knowing the domain they want already, which is easy. I remember when I first started my company a couple of years ago, it was like kind of overwhelmed, like they're trying to pick a name, trying to pick the domain, the host, like what, this is too much. Like, you know, somebody do for me, but you know, of course you got to do it for yourself, right? So how you do you do. Help, so how do you help entrepreneurs like pick through GoDaddy, Namecheap, and the host of others out there? How do you help them walk through that? Um, so, so like I said, sometimes they do come to us already. I'm personally a big fan of um, Google's domain service simply because they give you free privacy protection, which is really nice and helps you avoid all those fun spam emails that you get about like, hey, you need to redo your website right now. Um but I, I have sites, like I have my domains also on GoDaddy. And I think it's just, it's not as much of a matter of finding the cheapest offering out there, but just finding the one that you feel best about and maybe is best connected. Like if you're already on Google for a bunch of things, it's probably just easy to put your domain on Google too and register it with them. Um, so usually like very often we give clients like two or three options just because there are so many out there, like two or three options we trust and to recommend that they consider one of those. Brandy, next talk about how tech can be used to human, humanize us and connect us. Yeah, so it's, this is something that I feel like it, it's interesting because the natural tendency is, is to use technology to kind of um, intercept, like interrupt human interaction. Like, you know, like the less human interaction that you need to have to make a sale, the better. And 
I don't think it's not necessarily about injecting more, but I think it's about using technology in the right ways to facilitate real connection with people. So for example, um, I have a contact form on my site. When people fill out that contact form, it goes into my inbox. I read that. And then I determine what the next step for them probably is. Very often it's filling out a questionnaire for me. And what that questionnaire does is I'm utilizing a little bit of technology to get some answers for them. And it lets me get on a call with them and have a deeper conversation than like, what website pages do you want? Do you have a logo already? Like, I don't want to ask those questions. I want to figure out what they really need. Who are they? And like, what do they really want to create in the world? And how can I help facilitate that and bring that into existence? So I think it's just about, you know, using technology where you can to allow for a deeper conversation when you do have a a conversation with a human being. I have a client, he has a, an offering for financial planners. And one of the things that we were recently discussing was like integrating a little chat bot on his sales page, not to avoid human interaction with him, but actually to facilitate it so that as people are going through his sales page, if they feel like they need to actually have a conversation, that little chat bot would pop up and invite them to make an appointment for a call with him. And then it would ask for a little follow-up information so that he is better prepared for that call as well. So I think it's just about finding that opportunity even in like, even in the website copy to showcase like your quirks, you know, and, and your personality and your values, like that should come through. So I really like, that's how my brain kind of works when it comes to like using technology to humanize about having that just deeper connection when you do get a connection with the human being. So the chatbot is a chatbot stuff that you build out yourself or you, you use an API to use another company's chatbot. Oh yeah. We use, we other, we use other company stuff. I, I'm a big fan of, especially things like that. Cause like, again, this is a bit of an experiment for this client. Like we're going to use something that exists out there already. We're not going to custom code anything for him, not for that particular feature. So who's your stereotypical customer? Is it like a solopreneur, small business, corporation, certain, certain amount of revenue, certain industry? Yeah, not actually, surprisingly, not a certain industry, which I love. I love the fact that our clients are really kind of spread out across different industries. We've done websites for um, schools and education companies, for construction companies. We definitely do a lot for entrepreneurs though. So most often it's like, an entrepreneur who might have a small team, but is still kind of the face of their company. A lot of thought leaders, like an authors, which I adore. Um, I always think uh, authors have so much to say. And uh, yeah, that's that's kind of like, I, I, I just have fun with people who are, um, who want to put something out there in the world and want to make a change. So for me, those are, those are really my ideal clients, but I will say they, I have found those people in so many other industries too. They're, they're the thought leaders of their own industries as well, which is really exciting. So Randy, you joked a little minute ago, about you know, you get a spam email, we can fix your website, we do web development. I'm like, you know, there's like, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of people making websites. What sets you apart? What makes people, what most make people come to you versus someone else? I think the thing that sets us most apart is my particular approach to making sure that we get the client what they need for their business. Because yeah, there's lots of people out there who can build a site, um, but really I we spend a lot of time making sure that it's the right site and that it's, I always say like, it's gotta be the thing that is the foundation for their future. I don't want them to have to build a new site in five years. That's not my goal. I want this site, I wanna build something that's gonna evolve with them so we spend a lot of time, we do a lot of quality control testing. We do accessibility audits on sites and testing on sites as we go along. We are really thinking a lot, you know, about our clients and their business and where they're going, um, and then continue to think about that as they go along. But we're also spending a lot of time thinking about their users and what their users need and making sure that it's, it's you know, friendly to people overall, regardless of, um, you know, any disabilities that they may have. So Randy, do you, do you, do you set up the Google analytics for the website too, or that's something completely different? We do some basic setup of Google analytics. I do have conversations with clients where we do look at some of their analytics together. I'm 
as much as I love, I love good data, but there, I have to say there's sometimes an overabundance of data and it causes people to look at the wrong KPIs for their business. They're like, I oh, people, that. yeah, they like, they think um, people aren't spending, uh, they're only spending two minutes on my pages. That's terrible. But if they're converting and they're getting to where you need them to get, that's not a bad thing. So I think, you know, I usually tell people like for your site, this is what I would pay attention to when they start to ask me and interact. Cause it, there is, there's so much interesting, like Google analytics data that you can get into it with a site, but it doesn't all matter necessarily. Like, do you, do you care which country they're coming from? No. Do, do I care which device they're on? Maybe because as a developer, I'm going to make sure that they're, that the website's going to be accessible on those devices. And that's important to me, but does the business owner need to know that? Not all the time. So, so Brandy, you talk about us a little bit, your entrepreneurial journey. Can you go to more detail about your entrepreneurial journey, like how you got started on it? Uh, and also about your company, like how the company got started, your vision for the company and just the future for you and your company. Yeah. So like I said, I started out as a blogger, kind of taught myself to code, which, you know, I had an edge coming from physics and math, you know, like, especially like the way I coded lab reports for physics was in some ways, very sim similar to what you do on a website in like HTML or PHP. So taught myself a lot, um, spent a couple of years, honestly, just doing it on kind of a very amateur level. Um, before I started actually like actually quote unquote, started my business, meaning like before I went freelance, um, and I was freelance for about two years, two years, roughly before I, I realized that I needed to hire. And I, I don't think I even realized hiring was an option, but I was very fortunate in that I was in a wonderful mastermind program and the business coach who ran the program. Um, she, she had the saying that sometimes it's not about changing what you're doing. It's changing how you're doing it and trying to do everything myself felt exhausting. And I had so much work coming my way. I was saying no to some phenomenal projects that broke my heart to say no to, but I didn't have the capacity. So, um, you know, I hired an admin assistant first and then I hired two developers and one of my first develop developer hires just didn't work out. Like we clearly had totally different philosophies. I didn't even know how to define my philosophy or my process at that point. Um, but it was, so it was probably about six months into hiring my first team members that the admin assistant I hired came up to me and she said, you know, I tell people I'm working for you, but it just doesn't sound like a real thing. Cause at that point, my, my company was still called Brandy Bernoski. Like it was like coding.brandybernoski.com. Like that's all it was. And that's really what made me start to think about it being something beyond myself. And that I came up with the name Alchemy and Aim. Don't know how I do it, did it. Like naming things is so hard for me. Like if you need to name your business, I am not the person to come to. I'm sorry. Like I can send you to other people to name businesses. It was a just kind of a stroke of genius that it, it came to me. And I was like, that, that works. I think that's great. I like it. It resonates with me. And I officially switched it over to Alchemy and Aim. Um, and really it's just kind of like the product, like I kept building relationships with designers, the projects kept coming. And as a result, I kept hiring. And um, we're at the point now where we have like 15 people on the team. I have a project manager, we have a business assistant. I have uh, a phenomenal virtual assistant who also is like doing HR and accessibility and DEI work for us. Um, and it's just, it's become so much fun to explore where it can grow. So it's, yeah, it's just kind of been like a wild ride. It's, it's I'm about eight years in business so far. So about six years having a team and growing that team. So Brandy, what color languages do you know? Um, me particularly, I'm good at like CSS and PHP. Like my, everyone on my team, every developer on my team is a better developer than I am. It's a but I'm a very good right. problem solver still. So like sometimes, yeah. And like, I will sometimes suggest solutions that are so simple and that work. And, you know, are they the most, um, 
are they the most like elegant coding solution? Not always, but are they effective? Yes, yeah, sometimes. So I, I think it works that I have the right knowledge of everything and I understand how it all works. But at this point, I like, I'm never working on enhancing my development knowledge anymore because um, my real responsibility is to the business and, and to, to, you know, providing work for them and interesting projects for them. And they stay on top of all the fun new development code and quirks and things like that. When building a website or any kind of like a platform, whatever, does a code is being used really matter? Does it matter if it's PHP or Python or Ruben or Rails? Does that even matter? Um, it can, depending upon, I mean, I, for most people, no, really. Um, I'm, I'm personally just a fan of PHP. It runs so many types of sites and it's really straightforward and easy to work with when you're a developer. Maybe not if you're like average person, you should not be in your PHP code. But, um, <laughs> but certainly for me, like, I, I think most people can handle it. I think, you know, really when that distinction starts to kick in is when you start to have a larger business and you are, have more security and data precautions that you need to take into consideration in order to make your business work properly and not be at risk. So what's your opinion on this? Um, it's not like some developers out there, you, you give them something to build and all you need is like maybe like a simple plane, right? But they want to build this ma massive rocket spaceship, right? All the bells and whistles. How do you convince the developers like, no, I don't need this massive spaceship. I just need an MVP level like airplane, right? How do you, how do you walk through that? Uh, you find a good developer, really. Um, I, I think most, like most of my team members are very, uh, they're very kind of, process oriented. So they want to iterate. They don't want to build the crazy rocket ship first. They want to, to kind of create something that's solid to be able to test things and then move from there. So for me, it's just about, about finding the right people and the right hires. And, and that's actually so often what I recommend to clients that come to us as well. Like I had a client yesterday who's like, I want to build a membership site. I'm just getting back into my business after being away for four years. And I said, okay, you're not going to build a membership ship site yet. Like you need to focus on re-engaging with your list first, finding out where they are, what do they need? Like, do they want the membership site? What are you going to offer them? Like test the waters before you invest um, and then invest at a beta level first and take it up. So um, I think it's just about finding the right people who have the right philosophy about it and, and working with them on it. So it's not like a lot of people have challenges hiring software developers, either for, you know, not the right fit or not whatever the case may be, but it's like you kind of solve this. What's been your process like, like hiring the right developers for you and your company? So we actually start first with kind of a culture fit interview. So before I even assess, like, do they have all of the technical skills that they need? They need? Like we do kind of like a little pre-assessment when we get their resume and cover letter in. But um, we really spend some time getting to know them as the person and getting to them, know their philosophy and how they approach things before we get them into a technical interview. Um, so that's just really important to us. Like, I want to make sure that they are going to fit in well with the team, with how I like to approach projects for clients. Um, and then we start to kind of like dive deeper into um, kind of quizzing them on what they know and what they can do and things like that. Um, I do have to say the other really fantastic tool that I've always used in the hiring process. Uh, and, and I mean, I've used it because I was taught to use it, but is the Colby A index, um, which tests like work styles. So that's been really helpful for me to understand, like, you know, the, the test is a test of like how you naturally approach something. doesn't mean you can't work against your work style, but you work so much better in your natural work style. So I, I do pay attention to that as well because I want to create an environment for people to be able to thrive in the way that they naturally are built. Randy, can you talk about something good and something bad that's happened to you during your entrepreneurial journey? Sure. Um, I feel like there's been a lot of good things. So uh, I'm like, I'm not even sure how to choose just one. I'm like, especially like when you have so many fun clients the way that I do. One of the really good things though that's happened recently is that um, I'm actually testing out with one of my clients a partnership arrangement. So she's just a wonderful, wonderful human being and a brilliant law professor. And we're actually like, I'm helping her not just with the website, um, 
that we're building, but also with her business as a whole. So I'm kind of in a really fun partnership arrangement with her, which is new for me and exciting. And, um, it's just nice to work with someone like, I, I mean, many of my clients are wonderful people, but it's nice to be in a kind of a new different relationship with people. And then as for something bad, like I did have a hire once who um, I discovered was repeatedly lying to me about his hours and marking time that he was working, that he was not working. And it cost me about $20,000 um, between the time that he started doing that and, you know, discovering what was going on. So, um, you know, it's, it definitely hurts when you have worked with someone for some time and, you know, think that you have all the reason to trust them and discover that maybe there's less reason to trust them after all. So I've definitely been burned in the past um, in certain situations like that, but it does happen, unfortunately. And I think I'm stronger and wiser because of it. So Brandy, uh, talking about partners on your website, there's a part where there's, I think you have like a photographer on there, a brand designer. Are these people that work for you or the partnerships or what's that about? So because our main focus as a company is website development, we have a lot of collaborators we work with. So we have designers that we pull in for projects, copywriters, photographers. So for me, that page on my website is just a, really an opportunity to showcase some of the wonderful people that we have the ability to um, connect our clients with and really extend our services because we have relationships with them. So even though we technically don't do much design in-house, I do write design into a lot of the project proposals that we do because I want to make sure that the client gets the right team for them. And that's kind of one of my fun superpowers. Like I am really good at putting together like an ideal team for our clients. And like they so often rave about what a great fit it is overall. Do most of your companies come from the NYC area or is like equally disputed across the United States? It's, I will say, mainly across the United States. I don't think we get any people more in the NYC area than other areas, though we do have people in here. I have a lot of people in Texas too, and a lot of people on the West Coast. So um, we've even done some, some sites for people overseas. We get a lot of UK, but I had once a site uh, for a company. It was a children's company based in Russia. Um, and we've done sites as well for a lot of people in the like, you know, the Australia area as well. So next question. So like me personally, I get emails all the time from companies in India, Ukraine, Russia, all the places, you know, we use the website at, and, and, and pretty cheap prices, right? How do you compete with these cheap prices of other countries? Like how do you, is it, does their quality so much better or better customer service? Like how do you compete with that? I think it's all of the above. I think it's better quality. Yeah, better. I mean, definitely better quality, um, you know, better customer service, better process. And, you know, the thing that a lot of these companies aren't doing, like they'll code it. Can you, do you really know how good the code's going to be long-term? I have seen some really interesting coding approaches from overseas companies that like would not recommend and probably will break down very quickly. Um, but, you know, really, like I said, the thing that I think that helps us stand apart is not just the quality, not just the process, not just the customer service, but the fact that like we spend a lot of time with clients on the strategy, not for the, just the site, but for the way that the site engages with their business. So I sometimes tell people like, I don't think that's the best investment right now, or I think we need to scale that down and bring it down so that you're making it a better investment in, in your business. A lot of places won't tell you that. They'll just want you to spend with them. That's not my goal. My goal is to build a relationship with the client and make sure that they get what they need. Sometimes that means spending less money with me at the beginning to be able to build the right thing in the end. Yeah, I told most people don't realize there actually is a big difference between good code and bad code, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. There's and, and the, the amount of time a website will last too. Like I have a lot of clients who, you know, it's five years before we do another website with them because it's just lasted so well. And the thing that is really calling them to redo their website is that their business has now changed so much and that they need to rebrand and need to re-message. And that's why we're redoing the website, not because it's, it's not a great foundation that we already have. So Brandy, you know, you have a lot going on, you're an entrepreneur, you know, your, your, you know, your, your social life, everything you got going on. 
how do you say organized? Like, do you use your calendar? Do you have some kind of trick you use? Use Evernote, Asana, or you just wake up every day and just wing it? Like, what's your trick? Oh, I don't just wing it. <laughs> um, I, so I am a big fan of Google Calendar and just like Google Suite in general, but like Google Calendar. And I have like lots of calendars that all have color coding. So like I can look at my week and know when's a podcast interview because those are pink. When's a meeting with a collaborator because those are purple. Strategy calls are blue. So I'm actually able to kind of see where my energy is going in different places during the week from the color coordination. But my other like super favorite thing in the entire world is my bullet journal. And it's just, it's a simple moleskin book. And I, I just, I am like, I probably have like a, just a giant stack of them at this point from all the past ones that I've had, but I love my bullet journal to death. Um, every like night or at least early morning, I'm like reorganizing my tasks and making sure like my top tasks are at the, you know, kind of prioritized in my bullet journal that I'm really making sure I record all the things that I do and that nothing, the stuff that I have to do doesn't have to hang out in my brain. It's always coming out of me so that I can really use my brain for like creative things instead. I don't know how true this is, but I read somewhere, and I might be making this up, where like, like people who forget things are actually smart, are smarter than other people because your brain is, is pushing out the, the the stuff that doesn't matter, right? So you can think about important things. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know how true that is, but it seems like it makes sense though. Like your brain will automatically push out stuff that doesn't matter to keep important things in there. Yeah, and I think it's it's important that you make space for the important things too by like, pulling out those little things that worry you or, you know, that you keep kind of like half remembering to do, like, even if it's simple, as simple as like, I need to order cat food, you know, like I try to put all the things out of my brain into the bullet journal so that this space is more clear for, for other things and not just like for hanging on to random to do's that I have to work on. Brandy, for someone, you know, they have a business idea, the thing about starting a company, what advice do you have for them? I first thing I always tell people when they come to me and they tell me that they have an idea is reach out to your friends and family and network and make some sort of offer. You do not need a website to do it. You do not need a business card to do it. You don't need a logo. You don't even need a business name. If you are just thinking of maybe venturing into something, test it a little bit, see if you like it. Like you can always build on it, but I think it's so important to remember that you can you can allow yourself some like iterative process. You don't have to like come out of the gate with all of the flashy pieces that say I am an official business. Sometimes you just have to put it out there and see um, what comes back to you and what people think and say. So during your, during your entrepreneurial journey, what's something you wish you could have done over again? I don't know if there is anything I would do over. Um, I think everything has been so, so much of a wonderful lesson during the process. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't change something uh, because, you know, maybe it didn't go well. I think I needed to learn the lessons I've needed to learn. There's certainly like at this point in our process and in how well refined our process is, I, there's definitely some old sites that are still out there that like, I would love to recode if I had the chance, but I think that's inevitable for everyone. Like you are always getting better at what you do. So you're inevitably going to look at that early work and cringe just a little bit because you know, it can be better now because you know more than now than you did back then. But you also needed to, to do that back then in order to get to where you are now. Brandy, for your company, are you happy with where that? You, you, you're trying to scale and get way bigger in the future? Or are you just going to, like, you're going to have a bunch of, like, little franchise companies everywhere? Like, what's your plan for that? Yeah, I'm not planning to franchise this. I actually really love the size of the team. I would be willing to, like, you know, add another five team members maybe, you know, maybe have 20 people, 25 at the max. Um, but I like that it feels very familial to everyone and um, the team's very interactive and very supportive of each other. And I le like, that's a really good feeling for me personally. I am still working on what I need to put into place to achieve the goal of taking a solid four week vacation without my computer. That has not happened yet. I've made, I've made it a week in St. John with just my phone. Um, but I'm definitely like looking forward to like an, a real four week 
Italian vacation where there is not a computer with me and my only job is to eat really good food. And drink good wine. Yeah, exactly. So Brandy, I forgot to ask you this on the free talk, but were you gonna have me kind of give a discount to give away? I don't have a discount, but I would just, I, I always tell people like, please reach out to me on my website. Like I'm, you know, like I always do an intro call with people and I'm happy to just kind of be there for advice and support of people who need it and who have ideas. So, um, that's kind of like my, my little freebie is, you know, use my brain for a half hour. And, um, you know, if you, if you want to tumble around an idea with me, like I'm happy to kind of like rumble through something and, and help support you and where you're going. Brandy, can you give us your social media so people are going to reach out to you for, for both you and your company? Yeah. So on Instagram, I'm at Brandy Bernoski and Alchemy and AIM. Um, and then certainly, you know, the easiest way to get in touch is on our website, alchemyandaim.com. Um, and just head to the contact page, fill out the form. And I see that, you know, so. And to Alyssa, who have the links to her gift offer and to her social media on, the, on our show notes, you find the show notes at www.cabinetstakesallblog.com. And don't forget to support our crowdfunder at um, HTTPS CavendishHR.co slash crowdfunding. So Brandy, we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom on anything you want to talk about? I mean, I just think it kind of comes back to over and over again. It's just remember that everyone's in part of like you're evolving and your business is going to evolve and your ideas are going to evolve. So I think sometimes when you are willing to anchor into that um, and just know that you are not going to achieve perfection because perfection is the end, like the entire end point. And it, it's much more interesting to refine. So I'm a big fan of like excellence, not perfectionism, because sometimes excellence helps you go even beyond what you thought was perfect. And that's just kind of what I really invite everyone to is just to, to be in that evolution and just keep looking for ways to make it better. Not perfect, but better. Brandy, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me here. It was so great to chat with you, Jason. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.